which is good. All right, good morning. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed this morning singing and praising. Amen. I mean, what Dan was praying is exactly my heart for this morning. Um, as you see here, what we're doing is we're continuing on, like what Anthony started last week. If you guys weren't here, go back, listen to it, go back and listen to it anyway. It was a great word. Um, but it's just our, our hearts were just, I just, to see encouragement, to see strength built up. I mean, how many of us feel discouraged? I mean, that's, it's the number one thing we're hearing and I'm, I've been hearing a lot of is there's so much discouragement over the last two years. Pretty almost two whole years of discouragement um, drawn a lot from, but it's just the discouragement that seems to be just drawing, and it's just, and we can see it statistically. We can see it that the suicide rates, the depression rates, the the amount of alcohol usage and drug usage is going up worldwide, and uh, it's it's depressing, it's discouraging, and. It's, it's on our hearts as leaders and whatnot here. We want us to be encouraged. We want us to, as we were singing, you know, we sing about, uh, once again, I want to look on your face. I want to see you, Jesus. I want to walk this. I look at the cross and the cross that led to the tomb, that led to the resurrection, that led to life. I want to see that, and I want to be encouraged by that. And um, I know at times it's hard for me to feel encouraged, it's at times hard when you're looking around to feel encouraged. It's, it's hard at times when you're looking forward to feel encouraged. And so it's, it was kind of on our hearts to, to kind of share something to encourage, to encourage us to not shrink back, to not pull away from what God has called us to, but to encourage us in it. And so this first slide here, so our Lego people, who are the Lego people out here? <laughs> Tim, oh, come on, I know there's more than that. The <laughs> Lego people, yes. Oh, this, I put this slide up just to make sure I shared this story. It's this story that, that I've heard about these two samurai warriors. And um, a long time ago, this emperor put out that he wanted to know who his greatest warrior was. He had conquered the known world. This isn't a real story as far as I know. He had conquered the known world, and he wanted to know who his number one champion was. And so the reputation of these two mighty samurai came to him, and he said, I want them to fight. And being emperor, he could make them fight each other. Now, I don't believe it was a fight to the death, but it was a duel to see who the number one warrior was in all of the kingdom, and all of the world. And so these two Lego samurai came to each other <laughs> to battle and they both had renowned reputation. They were both well advanced in the years that they were just skillful in every way, in every discipline, in every fact of how they were to be these warriors. And they started to fight. And one of them, they came at each other and their forms looked beautiful and their flips and the, you know, they're doing all the cool kung fu movie moves. And then they come together and they clash. And all of a sudden, one of them obviously overpowered the other one in a point that it looked joking. And the emperor took offense. He called it. He said, stop. What's going on? Because he thought one of the samurai was making a joke out of this fight. So he started again. And they, again, they just beautiful form, beautiful. And they come together again. And the minute they come together again, the same samurai just collapses. The minute their instruments of war collide, his form falls apart. His balance is thrown off. He's not able to fight. He's not able to successfully do what, what he is supposed to do as a renowned champion. Now, there's, only, there's one difference between the two samurai. There's one difference. Both of them had trained and mastered their disciplines. Both of them had trained others and have spent years, and both of them were all renowned throughout the entire land. They knew of each other. 
The only difference was one of them practically used his skills in battle. And the other one had never left his dojo. He had only ever practiced his skills by himself. He'd only ever practiced his forms and his positions and his sword play and his staff play and the nunchuck play and all the other things that he does by himself. He had never actually tested his skills against somebody else that was worthy or that would challenge him or that saw him as an adversary, as an equal. He had never been put to the test in battle. So when the day came to the test in battle, his beautiful form was thrown off because it met resistance. That's why boxers punch punching bags. They punch the air to work on form, punching bags to truly know what it feels like to come in contact, to have resistance, to train for the actual battle. So that's what my heart and I hope our heart is, our desire is, so that when we are looking for what is coming, when we see the signs of the times, when we see all of this stuff happening, that we train and we equip and we do it in a way that when the battle comes, that when it's there, we are victorious, that we are hope-filled, that we are not looking defeated, that we are not like this master who has all the right words, all the right knowledge, all the right skills, but no practical ability to succeed. So our, the main scripture that is, all of this is pulled out of for the next you know, four weeks total is Revelation 12, 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, which is what we're going to address today, and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. If you have not memorized the scripture, do it. It is powerful, it is effective, it is encouraging, it will strengthen you. So this is a recap from Anthony last week. I wanted to tie it in, but remember, they is talking about us, or new covenant believers. Him, they overcame him, little little case H, you know, I... it kept trying to capitalize it for me. I had to go back and make it not capitalize that H. (laughs) is talking about the devil. And they overcame him. And it's a significance I wanted to point out here is that he says they overcame him. He didn't say you overcame him. And it's interesting when you think about through all of Scripture, how often does God talk to an individual specific person about their individual walk with the Lord devoid of anybody else? The Lord's Prayer. When you pray... Our Father. Not my Father. Our Father. We are a part of the what? The kingdom and the body. Now, I'm not a medical ex- expert, but is there any aspect of our body that can survive apart from the other parts of the body? Is there anything in our body that if you take it from the body and place it by itself, will survive? From my pitiful understanding of anatomy that is not possible there is not one part of our body that is completely self-sufficient we are not self-sufficient on our own we cannot look at this self-sufficient on our own we cannot go out into the world and go I am he roar and win you're not going to do it It's very significant. They overcame him. Jesus says, my church will what? On this truth, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. I've never seen gates attack anything. A spring gate might hit you in the backside on the way out, but they don't generally attack. They're there for defense. We go out. We are the conquerors. The body. I want to encourage you guys, if your first inclination is to draw aside to yourself, if your first inclination is to go, I need to isolate in in order to make myself holier, you're wrong. It is not biblical. (laughs) You won't find it in Scripture. Your relationship with God is an individual and a 
corporate reality. The devil has duped a huge chunk of the world into believing we are individuals in this. We're not. We're a body. Thank God. Thank God we don't have to do it alone. Lord, give us the humility to not do it alone. Right? Give us the the meekness to realize or the the strength to to realize that we need we need each other. We need the body. That is the only way we're going to come overcome. We are not alone and do not isolate. Okay? So what is the blood of the lamb? It talks about they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And I remember when I was first studying this scripture um, way back in the day and just kind of going through this going, what is the blood of the lamb? These two scriptures really stuck out to me. I think some people gave them to me to study. But in John 20, 17, Jesus said to her, this is right after the resurrection, do not cling to me for I have yet not yet ascended to my, the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. You know, he's talking to a single person, and yet he's using a plural form of identity to kind of re-enunciate that point. But what Jesus is saying here, he's like, don't cling to me, I've I've got to go to the Father. And there's a reason I think that, because in Luke 24, Jesus also says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now I put these two scriptures together because they don't seem like they're really, I mean, they're both the resurrected Christ, but I put them together because it's interesting here. He says for a spirit, because spirits don't have blood either, but he doesn't say that. And I, what I truly believe is what, John 20, on the way from conquering death to the Father, he saw, I believe it was Mary, right? can't remember. Hey, Mary? He saw her, took a pit stop, and said, hey, I love you. I'm going to the Father, because he was going to put his, mer- his blood on the mercy seat. Amen. And that is the whole jux. That is the whole pivoting point. That is the whole reality of our whole lives, guys. And that's why he says, you see me? Because he went to the Father, and then he came back down, and he was talking and hanging out with his disciples. He's like, you see me? I've got flesh. I've got bone. There's no blood because I put it out. I poured it out. I paid the price with it. It's on the mercy seat. The forgiveness is done. I think that's the significance of why he said there's no blood. Not that he ran out of it, but he took that precious, amazing, eternal blood and put it on the mercy seat for us. That's the significance of Uh, the blood of the lamb. It created a new covenant for us. It created a new way for us to walk in relationship with God as a body. So I wanted to just, from from this point, we're going to do kind of a, like we're on the ground here and we're taking off and we're going to, we're not even going to go 30,000 feet, guys. We're going in the stratosphere. Okay, because we're going to cover covenant, all right? But we're going to cover it from the stratosphere. So you're going to see the America as a map from up way up high. So if you, there's so much more. <laughs> there's so much more to this. So I want to cover what covenant is. Man, that is really small. Sorry about that. So a covenant is an agreement between two parties. It's the exchange of good or services for a set terms or price. So it's, there's a set reality of what's going on. It can be annulled by a higher party than whoever made the covenant. Biblically, it is the highest form of commitment. It is an agreement held with the utmost regard resulting in death generally as the punishment for breaking it. When God made a covenant with Abraham, he split the animal And the presence of God passed through the animal. And what that was pretty much saying, if we break this covenant, let it be done to us the same as we did to this animal. All right? And generally, like the covenant we're talking about today is made with God. It's eternal. All right? So now let's get into 
what it is. The differences in the covenant. This here is to help us take a breath. All right? Because that's the intro. <laughs> Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10. All right, really, if you want to get into the covenant, the book of Hebrews, just read the whole book of Hebrews. Right, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are the, uh, there's a lot about the covenants in 7, 8, 9, and 10. The whole book's got it all. This morning, we're going to cover 7, 8, 9, and 10 to get to where we want to go. Like I told you, we're going way up in space right now, okay? So take that deep breath. We'll be okay. All right, in Hebrews chapter 7 says that, For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. The law is the old covenant. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in their office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it, was separate, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a great high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. The significance of the covenant is for relationship with God. Now, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they, have a, they had a covenant with God. They had a relationship. And God said, we get to hang out. We're going to have a good time. Just don't eat this. They ate it. Now, the very first thing God did there was killed an animal to clothe them. That's the first recorded death in the Bible. He killed an animal to clothe them, to cover them up in their sinful state. What this is saying is the old covenant, that's all it did. It was just a stopgap. It was a covering up of the way we were, of the way that we were inherited through the way we were born. When you get that little two-year-old and they grab that little candy bar and they take a bite, you say, hey, did you take a bite of that candy bar? And they say, no, and they put it down. You don't teach that, right? That's natural to come out of them. Is that right or wrong? Wrong. <laughs> I was expecting a little more <laughs> voice from that here, guys. <laughs> I don't think, I'm pretty sure we know on that one, okay? This, that's wrong. They inherit it. They realize it. They know that's what it is. So why is it there? This is the old covenant right here is saying that, and it's right here is so, showing who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the Lamb. I hadn't said that yet. The blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus is what it's referring to. And it's showing right here how amazing Jesus is. All right, Hebrews 8. I told you, we're way up here. <laughs> we're not getting any lower. We don't have time. Hebrews 8. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So he's continuing here. He's sitting there going, all right, Jesus is ministering in the holy place that God built, that we did not build. In the New Testament, what does it call our bodies? If you're a believer, the temple, the temple of God. All right, right here it's saying Jesus is ministering in that place. He is ministering from that place. And the old covenant and the old way is a type and a shadow of what was to come. So it's good to see it. It's good to see, like the picture there, you know, we've got the hand and we've got the, the shadow of the hand. Which is more real? The physical hand, because it's going to, it can interact. If all you saw was the shadow, what would you assume? 
When you see a shadow, you assume there's something causing it. You don't just go, wow, look at that shadow. You go, look, there's a big tree, not a big shadow. We, we don't really ever, I mean, my kids talk about how big their shadows are at times because they can get taller than me. Okay, because that's their false reality at that point. <laughs> but it's not real. So it was a type and a shadow of the better that was to come. All right, let's keep going. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed up. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his own neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Thank the Lord. Think, if we were still in the old covenant, we would not have this kind of carpet, guys. <laughs> there would be a smell, there'd be some fire, there'd be a lot of dead animals, there'd be a big old dumpster out back holding ashes. It would it'd be a whole different experience, a whole different reality. I think it's really interesting there. He says, and they shall be my people and they will know me. See, in the Old Covenant, the people lived their lives, and there was a select tribe, the Levites. They were the only ones who had a relationship with God. They were the only ones that ministered within the holy place and once a year into the Holy of Holies. They were the only ones that were permitted to be close to God. Everybody else, they, they relied on them to offer the sacrifices to pardon them of how they've messed up all year long. Now he says in the new covenant, you get to know me, each of you, individually, personally. You get that relationship. And when we do that personally, we get it as a body, and as a body, we see the power of God. We see as as a nation. We see how powerful and wonderful and beautiful it looks to be with him. Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through it the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, the blood of the Lamb, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the defiled persons with the ashes of the heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, the perfect, spotless, sinless, remember a couple of chapters before he was talking about how worthy this blood is. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, And after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He has provided perfect cleansing. He has given us the gift of his own blood to sanctify us, 
to purify us, to make us whole, to make us clean. Not for a short period of time, but for this next slide here is uh, math, because I love math. All right? <laughs> but he, he gave us his blood because it's eternal blood. So what this slide right here is, that's the symbol for eternal or infinite. The figure eight, that eight on its side is infinite in math. And so I, I chose a dandelion because we all know dandelions. And how long do dandelions last in your yard? <laughs> the individual plants. <laughs> so when that little individual shoot comes up, it only lasts a sh short time. <laughs> but yes, dandelions do come back new generations. <laughs> Individually, they don't last forever. <laughs> so what that represents is finite, something that is short, something that is not infinite. Even if it's a thousand years, it won't last forever. So if you take something that is finite and you multiply it by something that is infinite, you get infinite. It's math. So if you take something that is infinite and multiply it by something that is finite, you get infinite. See, math, guys. It's in the Bible. It's good. All right? Youth, math. Yes. <laughs> And I'm not even a math, well, I am a math teacher this year. So, <laughs> but the, the reason I wanted to bring this up here is because it says, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting. I, I've heard some people say, how is it that one person suffering for a few hours, and they were long hours, but one person suffering for a few hours can pay the price for the I mean, how many people have ever lived? And I heard, I don't remember who it was, but I heard this guy say, when you take an infinite person, Jesus, God, and you multiply him by a finite time of suffering, you get an infinite result. That's why the bloods of goats and bulls and pigeons doesn't last because they were finite beings. They were finite created things. But when you take God himself, infinite, and you sac he sacrifices himself for the finite, we get eternal life with him. Isn't math cool? I, when I was like, yay for math. <laughs> but think about it when we get it. Don't make that face, bud. <laughs> You're doing really good in math this year. We get the benefit of an infinite sacrifice. That's why what Jesus did on that day lasts forever. That's why it says, before the foundations of the earth, he was crucified. Because he's infinite. It's beyond all of that. And it provides us a way so that when his second coming, he's not coming back to pay for our sins again. He's not coming back to justify sin again. He's coming back to get those who have accepted his infinite sacrifice embraced it, allowed it to transform them to continue in that relationship for all eternity. That's why he's coming back. That's the significance of the covenant. That's the power of the blood of the Lamb. Without the blood of the Lamb, we do not get that. We do not get the benefits. We do not get the relationship. We don't get the conscious. It's where we can go to bed at night trusting and believing and hoping with peace. Because I don't like not being in peace. I don't like there to be unsettlement with people, especially with God. We don't have to. All right, so that is our aerial view of covenant. <laughs> There is so much more, so much, and it is well worth digging into. If this encouraged you just a little bit, digging into the covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant will 
make your encouragement level go through the roof, okay? It is, there's that much, all right? So there's our math again. So now we can take a breath. We just did our space view of the covenant and uh, finished the introduction of the message, <laughs> all right? So now we're on to the message, right? <laughs> That's the way I see which is victory, guys. That is the message of Revelation 12, 11. And they have overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, not forsaking their lives unto death. When we take time to look at what is coming, when we take the time to see the times that we are living in, we cannot allow it to discourage us. We cannot allow it to make it break ourselves down. Because when we do that, we are forgetting the blood of the Lamb. Encourage yourself, stir yourself up. If you have been discouraged by what you see in the world, by what's happening, by what's happened around, this discouraging things happen, guys. We've all have had discouraging stuff in this last year. Big discouraging stuff. Death, um, loss of jobs, big things like that. If we allow those things to break our spirit down, we are forgetting the blood. And I would, I would challenge you that it's in those times especially that we have to get around the body. It's in our weakest times that pulling away to yourself is only going to hurt you. That is exactly what our enemy wants. You take one guy who can fight better than anybody else in the world and you put him against a hundred guys who are half as good as him, he's losing. Right? You see it in football. You take one freakishly good athlete and you put him on a bad team, what happens? He's going to get hurt. <laughs> Because he's going to try to do it all because he's that much better. You see it in high school football especially. You get that one freak athlete that just give him the ball. <laughs> just give him the ball and he runs over everybody. If he can get through high school unhurt, he's got it. But they, a lot of those guys get hurt. If your first inclination when you hit hard times is to pull back, stop. That's when you need your body. If I get something in my eye... And all of a sudden, my eye pops out of my body and runs into India. I can't help that eye. It's going to die. Right? It needs its fingers to reach in there and pull out that splinter or the speck or whatever it is. We need each other. And that's how we have the victory, guys. That's how we have it. So when we hear about the times that are coming, when we hear about hey, false teachers, when we hear about all this stuff, we need to hear about it. We need to know it. We need to see it. Because he says, do not be unaware of the schemes of your enemy. Don't be unaware of it. And the nice thing is, is he doesn't change. He's been doing the same gig for a couple thousand years. Because it works a lot. But he plays that same tune. And when you figure out somebody, how they play, you can take care of it. That's our victory, guys. All right, so here I want to go through practical ways that we can see the victory, the, the blood of the Lamb applied to us today, okay? So here are some practical ways for you to use. So when you hear about things that discourage you, when life happens, because that's just the way it is, when life happens... And it just stinks. We need to have practical tools in our tool belts, in our hands, in our body that will help us make it through those times. Because without them, we get discouraged. We get disappointed. Our hearts get hurt. We pull away. Then we hurt other people because we're hurting. And then we hurt our relationship with God because we get angry at God. And then we find ourselves in this really weird quagmire of a place where there's no joy, there's no peace, there's no fruits of any of the Spirit. And we, we can't hear anything. We're in a doldrum. There's nothing going on. And we're just sitting there screaming. 
And we know all the truth in the world, but we've forsaken the application of it. I don't want to do that. That's a scary place to see. That's a scary place to go. Don't do it, all right? So I want to look at some practical tools. So the first thing that the blood of the Lamb has done that I see, that it, is, it impacts our identity, okay? In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does anybody know who the book of First Peter is written to? I, I remember, but I'm going to read it. Does anybody know? Just off the top of your head? I couldn't hear it. Christians, yeah. Here's the exact, the, what Paul says, all right? Or Peter, sorry. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. That's a lot of places, guys. He's writing this to these people, to those who are the elect exiles, to the Christians. And then he rattles off an insane, a giant geographical portion of the world. <laughs> To the believers of this area, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That is who we are in the new covenant, guys. You are a priest or a priestess. That is your identity. That is your role. That is who you are because of the blood of the Lamb with Jesus Christ as your Savior. In Corinthians 1-2, it says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. You know, Pastor Dan touched on this this morning a little bit in Sunday school, but he was talking about um, the book of Philippians is written to the saints, and he's talking about who the saints are. The saints are the holy ones in Philippi. Well, Paul, not to be outdone, calls the saints of everywhere, but it's the believers. And what is a saint? It is a holy person. It is a sanctified person. It is somebody who is made, set apart, that is pure. How many of you are saints? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are biblically a saint. And we need to think that way. I don't know if any of you know, but there was a Catholic saint that was just sent from Wichita up to, where was it? Pilsen, right? Yeah. Just Saturday. Had a motorcade of motorcycles leading him. And this guy was, he's sainted because of his life. I don't, know who, I don't know anything about the guy. I'm, I'm not trying to say anything about the guy. But it's a very significant thing. And everybody was super excited because we got a saint coming through the state. And I'm sitting there going, dude, you got a saint standing right in front of you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but we have to think that way. I didn't get the slide up there because my wife told me no more slides. <laughs> I wanted and I, part of me wishes I had it, but I wanted to put a slide up there with a, somebody's head opened up and a big old pile of dookie sitting in there because one of my favorite sayings, Ray hasn't said it a whole lot, but a lot of us have stinking thinking. And this is one of those places we've got stinking thinking. And it is stinky. And it comes out. And it is not good for your heart. It is not good for the way you think. It is not good for the body. It's discouraging when somebody's like, I'm a savior, and then they're just like, bleh, about who they are. Ugh. No. The blood of the lamb is more precious than that. Don't talk down on it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Uh, this is a life verse for me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Remember, this is written to 
believers, all right? And I, I love this because in, uh, in the original, the new creation is like new beast. It's a, it's a completely brand new thing, new creature. That's what it means. That, so people that knew me when I was young don't know me now. So when they hear about me now, it makes no sense. My family, it doesn't make sense to them who I am now because they don't know me anymore because I'm not the same person. I have the same name, the same look, but I'm not. I am a new creation, and I have to remember that. I have to stir myself up at times because there are times where I don't feel that way. There are times when I'm being dumb and I don't behave that way as a holy, sanctified saint that's a new creature. And that's repentance. And that's where we get that blessing there. So our identity is one way we can apply practical tool in that, guys. So when we see the times that are coming, we look at it, we go, that's what's coming, but this is who I am. A great example that um, I, this one guy says, he's like, you know, when I said yes to my wife, I said no to four billion women. <laughs> and it is. There's a big no to every other woman in the world. There's only one yes to my wife. And that's the only one. She's the only one that's getting it. We have to think that way with who, are, who we are. This is who I am. Yes. No, that is not me, okay? Applying that. We see it coming. Okay, that's what's coming. This is who I am. When somebody is confident, um, Leonard Ravenhill was sharing one, a story. When he was a kid, he was in uh, uh, Bath, which is a city in England. It's a very ancient city. And he was running around, and all of a sudden he saw this group of girls walking through the city center, he was like, and there was nothing, I mean, they were wearing nice clothes, but he was like, there was nothing on the eye that was particularly different about them. He's like, but there was something about how one of them in particular carried herself. She just walked with confidence. She walked through that, and everybody in that city center noticed her. And he found out later it was Queen Elizabeth. And she was walking through that city as a princess. She knew who she was. She had full assurance of her identity that this was her kingdom, this was her city, and she had every right to walk with full confidence knowing that she was safe, that she was protected. No matter what was going on around her, her world wasn't going to be shaken. He said he literally could see the difference in her countenance. When we walk, we need to walk with that same style where there's just a literal countenance about who we are. So when people start talking about this stuff, and be like, okay, yeah, it stinks, and yeah, it's going to affect life, but it doesn't affect me because this is who I am. Our nature is another thing that the blood of the Lamb impacts and Ezekiel 36, and this also um, cross-references with, I, I believe it's Hebrews 9, as well as Jeremiah 33. But in Ezekiel 36, it says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put inside of you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. He has changed who we are. Corinthians, you are a new creation. He didn't... He didn't the, the picture of it is, it's, it's, it's not like he just took your clump of clay and remolded it. It's like he took your clump of clay and he threw it so far away that nobody would ever find and he had a new clump of clay and he made it perfectly brand new. It's brand new. And this is what he's talking about with our heart. 
when you come into relationship with Jesus by grace, through faith, and what he has done in appointing the new covenant, you get a new heart. And right here he says that new heart will have God's law written on it. And it will motivate you to walk in relationship with him. Walking in relationship with him is following his statutes and seeing that come about. And I will put my spirit, the spirit of God, because he makes us the temple now. And he will put the Holy Spirit inside of us and cause us to be careful to obey so that we do not go back, so that we can continue forward in this relationship. We need to see ourselves that way, practically. We need to see that we are pure. Sounds very similar, right? The blood of the Lamb, is, is, it does that much of a clean sweep for us. We need to see that our hearts have been taken from a stone heart into a living flesh heart. I think it's very significant that he doesn't take our brains. And I've felt many times very unfortunate. I wish he would have <laughs> just plucked out my brain and given me a new brain. <laughs> uh, but as I've grown with the Lord, what I believe he has done that for is because he has caused my heart to desire him more than anything else in the world. And now I get the privilege of showing him that love and that passion by allowing my brain to be renewed into his likeness, allowing my thinking, allowing and seeing and, and using and, and walking with the body and with the word and with Holy Spirit to see my brain transformed, as it says in Romans 12. <clears throat> it's not just a snap, but our, our nature changes, guys. And then our minds. So Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Some translations add it. That's how I memorized it. <laughs> Adds it on there. Corinthians says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging a war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, or the King James says, vain imaginations. We destroy arguments and every loft opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. By the blood of the Lamb, we wage this war, not through the flesh. Through your flesh, you're going to pull aside, you're going to get alone, you're going to do it yourself, you're going to grab your bootstraps, and you're going to just jump and look kind of goofy. Have, has anybody ever tried to pull themselves up by their bootstraps? I've tried, just for, just see if I could do it. Pride. <laughs> I did. I, I reached down, grab them, and you just kind of yank up. You fall on your butt. I did it when nobody was watching. <laughs> uh, thinking I'm never going to share this someday, but yeah, here we go. Now you can all have a picture of me falling over backwards. <laughs> but that's what it is. When we get alone, when we do not wage the war, when we wage the war according to the flesh, because that's how the flesh wages war, right? You man up and you do it on your own. But that is not how the kingdom of God does it. In Romans there, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He's talking to people that have been given a heart of flesh. And he says, do not allow the world to mold you. Do not allow the world to dictate your peace. Do not allow circumstances going on around you to tell you how you're going to behave. You allow Holy Spirit, the Word of God, God Himself to dictate 
who you are, how you behave, and the way you go about your day. And only that. When we do that, it will look like Jesus. Because he did only what he saw the Father doing, and he spoke only what he heard the Father speaking. I want to do that. That would be amazing. One way we can go for that goal is not allowing this world to dictate our reality. When bad things happen in our lives, it doesn't dictate who I am. I enjoy just sharing my testimony with a guy a um, week and a half ago. <laughs> I'm sharing my testimony with him, and, and I don't know this guy at all. I mean, literally, we're, he was with me for a few hours, a couple days. Whoa, I'm walking off the stage. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm sharing my testimony with him, and he's like, Really? He's like, no. He's like, oh, so you didn't really do, like, serious drugs. He's like, no, I did. So, yeah. I said, I, I don't know a lot of what I did. I just did whatever I could get my hands on. And it, it wasn't marijuana. <laughs> and he was like, really? He's like, you, you really weren't that mean to animals. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I don't know this guy at all. But in just being with me for a day, he was like, there's no way, dude. He's being honest with me. Because I was like, dude, if you're honest with me, I'll be honest with you. We'll be straightforward. I'm, we're not going to dance around. We're not going to do this little, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Like, no. <laughs> Jesus is inside of me. You're going to be around me. He's going to jump on you. It's okay. <laughs> that's all that's going to happen, all right? Because <laughs> he loves you. And, so he, and he was. He was honest with me. And he, he didn't believe it. And I love that because to me, that means, all right, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing it. Not because of me, but because what he says. I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you. It's only by the grace of God. It's only through the power of God. It's only by any of that that I am here right now. That my life is somewhat in order. That I'm not in jail. That I'm not peddling drugs or whatever else I would have come up with. It's not my strength. I will boast in what the blood of the Lamb has bought and done in my life. All day long, every day. And we need to, guys. That's how we will not be conformed by this world. That is how we wage war according to the Spirit, not the flesh. Do not do this on your own. I'm hearing that a lot this morning. And maybe it's just because we're American and that's what we do. But we don't. We are the body. Get messy together. Mess up. Get offended. Repent. Offend some people. Not on purpose. You're going to do it anyway, okay? So don't do it on purpose. But if you offend people, don't run away. Clean up your mess and make things right and move on with life. So here's some tools to apply these realities. Because that's what they are, the realities. We need to declare what God has done out loud. Out loud. Declare it. If you're around me in my Walmart when I'm working at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and I'm the only one in the aisle, you will hear me declaring the promises of God. You will hear me declaring who he says I am. And depending on how I'm being, you know, how my life's going or what's going on in my life, you're going to hear different things. You're going to hear, you are a man of God. You are upright. You are my chosen one. You are accepted. Because I need to hear those, to believe them, because that's what the blood is paid for. And we have to do it out. You have to hear it, guys. It, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it, and it's touching me right now. That's why music touches so much of us, because we're singing out loud promises of who God is. That's why I love music, because it's declaring. 
when you get into those hymns and this new, oh, you just declare the power and the wonder of what God has done. And don't ever say you can't sing. Squawk. Okay? We have to allow the reality of who God has made you to win. We have to choose to let that win. You know the old Indian saying, he's got two dogs, and the little boy walks up and says, hey, which dog is going to win a fight if they fight? He says, the one I feed. That's the same with us. Which dog is going to win in your mind? The flesh, the, the, the heart flesh that God has put inside of you that is striving, longing for him, or the carnal desire to be conformed to the world? What are you following? Are you following the precepts of the Scripture and God and being in the body and being built up in the line? You have to set your life up for success. Otherwise, you're going to lose and you will not have victory and you will be discouraged and depressed and, uh, as Ray says sometimes, baptized in vinegar. Believers. Pickled. Not good. We have to trust our environment does not dictate our reality. Jesus says in Matthew 15, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles him. Our world does not defile us, guys. What's going on in our world does not dictate who I am. What's going on in the spirit around us doesn't dictate the peace I have with God. It better not. It does sometimes, if we're honest. I allow it. We can't allow it. We have to wage that war according to the Spirit. We have to see what's going on. And that's the beautiful part. The body helps us do it. In any sport, generally the coach isn't the best athlete, wasn't the best athlete. From what I've gathered and the greatest coaches I've had, I've had a few that were just, they were phenomenal athletes and they ended up being great coaches as well. Great coaches aren't the ones who are able to do everything perfectly. They're the ones who are able to see what somebody else is doing, show them what they're doing wrong, show them how to do it right, and then coach them into continuing and developing that. You could have somebody that can't throw a football 20 yards teach somebody to be the greatest quarterback in the world because he knows and he can see it and practically press it and do it. Just like the samurais, right? Which one was the better one? The one who had the practical, who do you want to be trained by? The one who's going to teach you how to do the perfect forms or the one who's going to teach you how to do the, the forms correctly and successfully as well? We can't allow what's going on around us. This picture I put up here, it's hard to see because it just, it just doesn't show up even up close. Amy couldn't see what it is. But that's a greenhouse in the middle of winter. In the background, those are actual spruce trees with, with uh, snow on top. All right? So when we lived up north, we had some friends that had a, uh, a tomato farm in northern Wisconsin. And they grew wonderful tomatoes. They were very good. And uh, it was really interesting because as we got to know them, we would go over there in October, which October up there is a lot colder in here. Stuff's not growing anymore. And November, and they're still producing tomatoes. And then they shut down for December, and then they start again in January, one of the coldest, nastiest months of the year. <laughs> and they have tomato plants growing in February when there's five feet of snow outside. But when you walk into their greenhouse, you walk in, because it's negative 20, with your parka freezing cold, and the minute you walk in, you're tearing everything off because it is hot. It's 75, and the humidity is way up high. It's a wonderful environment to grow tomatoes. That is what God has done with us. He has given us a new body. He's given us a new heart. He's given us a new spirit. He has completely encased us, like it said in Hebrews, with a new tent. What's going on around doesn't impact what's going on inside. If it starts to impact what's going on inside, remind ourselves that's it. Stir yourself up. Remember, 
Trust. Trust what God has done. And we need to spend time with God. We need to spend time with God. And when I say we need to spend time with God, I mean literally we need to spend time with God as a body. Do it alone. That's fine. Cool. It's wonderful. Don't brag about it. Just do it alone on your own. Let's do it. But we need it together. We need the body. If you are not spending time with God, with the body, you're not likely going to be that healthy. You're not. You're not likely going to have victory. There are, you know, well, what if I'm on an island and I'm the only one? Well, that's it. We're not on an island and you're not the only one, so quit using the illustration, <laughs> okay? That's what, I thought that too. When I, was, when I was in college, I went through a really dark time and I was not doing well and I was just like, it made God and my, my five-year plan out of college, honest to God, I wrote it down and turned it into class. I didn't keep the copy. I wish I had um, my five-year and ten-year plan, graduate college, live out of my car at Hobo Park in Wichita for a couple, two years to raise up enough funds to either fly or drive to uh, South America because I was like, it's going to cost too much to get to India. Um, get off a plane or a train or a car in South America and just hike out into the woods. That was my 10-year plan in college. That was what I, and then I read a book about a guy who did it, and I'm like, why didn't I do it? <laughs> he pretty much did that exact same thing, but that guy is gifted in ways I'm not. I don't do language. <laughs> but that was my plan. And that was a horrible plan. <laughs> Even the book that I, Bruco, which is a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, read it. It's a wonderful book. But the, the struggles that guy went through, he didn't have to if he would have had the body. <laughs> Okay, it's a great story and it's encouraging, but I'm sitting there going, dude, you didn't have to do it this way. Had you been obedient in the body, you wouldn't have done it this way. And I truly believe that. He wouldn't have had to hike. And I'm not going to share some of the stories. They're gross. But that was my plan. That was not a godly plan. I thought it was from God. Because I was like, it's me and Jesus and that's all I need. That's all I want. And then I see my wife, and I get a vision, and then life. And I find out what real life is like, <laughs> all right? We need to spend time, time with God. Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you you go. The Lord is speaking to Joshua right after Moses dies here. And in verse from 6 to 9, I think it's four times, he says, be strong and courageous. Be strong in your identity and the reality of what God has done and the reality of the blood of the Lamb and the reality of the new covenant and the reality of the body of Christ and be courageous enough to be selfless and go for it. I want to encourage you guys, be strong and courageous. When you hear about what's coming, be strong and courageous. When you hear about all the bad things that are about to happen, be strong and courageous. Do not be dismayed. Do not allow rumors of wars and wars and pestilence and false teachers to dismay your heart. Allow the Lord to stir you up. Allow the body to build you up. Be strong and courageous. For that is how we will have victory. That is how we will see the full of what we can see from the kingdom of heaven. That is how we will have transformation. I'm going to pray if the worship team wants to come up. Father, I thank you so much. Oh, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you that you came as the perfect sacrifice. That you came and you poured out your blood. 
Lord, help us. Lord, strengthen us. Lord, help us to be courageous enough to admit when we need help, to be courageous enough to strive and to seek your face. Lord, help us to be courageous enough to walk with the body. Father, I ask that you would just just put this in all of our hearts. I ask that you would just open up every single one of us and our hearts in a new way and building us up and realizing that what is going on and what is going to happen and what is coming, we need to know about it. We better know about it, but it doesn't change us. Lord, thank you that it doesn't have to. Holy Spirit, thank you that you live in us. Thank you that you instruct us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for using the body to build us up. Bless us this week. Bless us for the rest of our lives, for all of eternity, with the practical reality of what we can apply with this covenant from your blood. I love you, Jesus. Amen.